In this video, we are going to talk about hypothesis testing, the concept, how we approach it, and the potential errors associated with it. Hypothesis testing really underlies what we are going to do when we cover regression, especially relative to p-values and to confidence intervals. What is hypothesis testing? It's analyzing the difference between the observed results from our data and what you would expect to see if the null hypothesis were true. Does the sample refute a claim? Do we have sufficient evidence to say with confidence that something is likely not true? We do that by looking at the statistical properties of the sample and ask if the difference likely too large to be explained by sampling error or random noise. There are six steps associated with hypothesis testing. First, we state the null hypothesis that we are trying to reject. We will call it H0. And then we state the alternative hypothesis that we call H1. We then choose a level of significance that we call alpha and the sample size denoted N. Then we determine the appropriate test statistics and the sampling distribution for that specific statistic. So if the statistic is the mean, we look at the sampling distribution for a sample mean. These really depend on the problem you are approaching and uh, if you have different things you're looking at, whether it's the mean, the variance, the t-statistic, each time you will have to look at a different sampling distribution. Then we determine the critical values that divide the rejection and the non-rejection regions for our sample statistic. And we will talk exactly about what those mean in great detail in this video. And then we'll collect the data based on the sample size we determined before. And we'll compute the value for the test statistic in our sample. Finally, we'll compare the test statistic we obtain with what we expect to see and we'll make the statistical decision, which is whether we reject the null hypothesis or if we fail to reject it. Then we'll state the managerial conclusion. Here is something very important for the exam because a lot of students lose points on this. We never say that we accept the null hypothesis or that we accept the alternative hypothesis. That results in zero points for the whole question. There are two possible outcomes for hypothesis testing. The first one is that we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. The other outcome is that we don't have enough evidence and we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We don't know in that case if the null hypothesis is true or false. We just failed to show that it was false. To understand hypothesis testing, we have to understand the distinction between the population value, sometimes called the true value, and the sample statistic. We are usually stating the hypothesis about an unknown value in the population, for instance, the population mean, or the population variance, the population correlation between two variables. For instance, that could be the average height of all the students in the School of Business. Then we are testing our hypothesis by using a value obtained from a random sample, which is usually a small sample, small sample relative to the population. Then we will have the sample mean, and the sample mean will be different from the population mean. So usually we denote the population mean mu, and mu x if it's about the variable x, and then the sample mean we call it x bar, or which can change the name, Z bar, Y bar, and so on and so forth. The population mean is unknown. We're trying to guess it, or we're trying to make a statement about it. For instance, I think the population mean is greater than five. And then we have the sample mean, we measure it, and that will help us conclude with a statement about the population value. Now I want to spend some time explaining the conceptual approach behind hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is based on the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution represents the probability of seeing some values for a summary statistic 
that is sampled from a population repeatedly. In this example, we are looking at the sample mean. Our null hypothesis that we call H0 is that the true population mean, mu x, is equal to some value that we call mu0. For instance, we would say mu0 is 5, so H0 would be that the true population mean is 5. And then we have the alternative hypothesis, which is that um, mu x, the population mean, is anything else but mu0. And we want to test that at uh, alpha level, that is 5%, 0.05. So if we assume in the null hypothesis um, that the population mean is really mu0, we would expect the sample mean to follow the sampling distribution that we represented here on the graph. According to this distribution, we would expect it to be very close to the population mean. We would expect x bar, or sample mean, to be close to mu0. What is considered close would depend, of course, on the sample size and on the variance uh, in the population. If, on the contrary, the sample mean we get is very far from what we expect under the null hypothesis, then the null hypothesis is probably false. On the graph, the regions we consider too far are the grayed out areas beyond the critical values on the right and on the left. So if H0 were true, if the population mean were really mu0, the probability that our sample mean x bar falls into the gray dot area would be alpha over 2 for the left rejection region and alpha over 2 for the right rejection region. Adding these two rejection regions together, the probability that the sample mean falls that far from the population mean is at most alpha, which is 5%. This is a low probability, so we would infer that H0 is likely not true, and we will reject H0. Be careful, don't say that we accept the alternative hypothesis. This is false, we only rejected H0. Now, as mentioned before, the sampling distribution of a sample mean depends on the true mean mu and on the true standard deviation sigma as well as the sample size. So every time we have a different mu and a different sigma, we need to know a different sampling distribution, which is not convenient. Instead of doing that, we can do some math and create a different sample statistic, not the sample mean, but the statistic that we call the t-statistic, which always follows a student t-distribution. So now, instead of knowing a lot of different sampling distribution, we can only refer to one sampling distribution, which is the T distribution. So when the population standard deviation sigma is unknown, the T statistic is calculated as X bar, which is a sample mean, minus mu, which is what we think the population mean is, over s, which is a sample standard deviation, that's our best guess for sigma, over square root of n, and n here is a sample size. In large enough sample, or when the population is normally distributed, then x bar follows a normal distribution, and we know exactly which normal distribution it follows. It follows a normal distribution with a mean of mu, and a variance of sigma square over n. Now, if we take this x bar and do x bar minus mu, now we have a normal distribution with mean zero. So instead of knowing a lot of normal distribution, one with mu equals one, one with mu equals two, we just need to know one with mu equals zero. But now we have still different types depending on sigma. So we are going to take this x bar minus mu and divide it by sigma over square root of n. And now this statistic follows a normal distribution with mean 0 and 1. So this always follows the same distribution, the same sampling distribution. The problem here is that we don't know the population uh, sigma. So instead, we use our best guess for it. We use S. But now instead of having a normal distribution, we have a student T distribution. So our T statistic is x bar minus mu over s 
over square root of n. This follows a student t distribution, and it only depends on the sample size. So we call it the degrees of freedom, and the degrees of freedom are n minus 1. So we only know, need to know this one sampling distribution. Let's look at an example. We're considering to move to Madison, Wisconsin to study, and we want to know if the city has good restaurants. For us, we consider that uh, the city has good restaurants if the average review on Yelp is higher than 3.0. Note that if we want to show that the average review is higher than 3.0, it means we want to reject the contrary. We want to reject H0, the average review is less than 3.0. And then our alternative hypothesis, what we want to show, H1, the average review, is greater than 3.0. So we collect a sample of 100 reviews, and we find that in our sample, the mean is 3.15, and the standard deviation is 0.62. Now we can compute the t-statistic. The t-statistic is computed as the sample mean, 3.15, minus the value we are considering, 3.0, that's the value in H0, divided by the sample standard deviation, 0.62, over square root of 100, which is our sample size. We find a t-statistic value of 2.41. So if we look at the sampling distribution for this t-statistic, the student t-distribution with degrees of freedom 100 minus 1, 100 being the sample size, we find that there is a probability of less than 5% that our t-statistic is greater than 1.64. That is, if H0 is true. And we find the t-statistic of 2.41, so it's in the red area, it's further than the 1.64. So it's, it has a low probability. We have a low probability of finding a value that that big if H0 is true. So we can reject H0 because our t-statistic is in the critical region. Here are a few possible errors in hypothesis testing. We have two possible cases in the reality. Either H0 is true or H0 is false. We will never know. We don't know which one is true. And we are making a decision. Either we reject H0 or we fail to reject, we do not reject H0. Now, in the case where in reality H0 is true and we reject it, we are rejecting something we shouldn't have rejected, that's a type 1 error, rejecting a true null hypothesis. The probability of making this type 1 error is alpha, which is the significance level for the test. In general, we'll pick alpha is 0.05 or 5%. So the probability of making a type 1 error in that case is 5%. It is set in advance by the researcher. Now, if in reality H0 is true and we fail to reject it, we made a good decision. We didn't reject something that was true. On the contrary, if H0 is false, and we decide to reject it, we rejected something that's false, we did a great job, we made the right decision. However, if in reality H0 is false and we fail to reject it, we made an error, we should have rejected it, it was false, and that's called a type 2 error, failing to reject a false null hypothesis. The probability of a type 2 error is directly related to the power of the test and basically it depends on what the real true population value is. Generally, we don't know what it is, so we cannot compute the power of the test. The probability of a type 1 error is set in advance. We can decide that alpha equals 5%, for instance. Once this is set, there is not much we can do about it. There will be a 5% chance that we make a mistake if H0 were true. Now, in the case where H0 is false, 
there is another type of error we can do, the type 2 error, which is to fail to reject it because it's, it's false, so we should reject it. There is something we can do to minimize this type of error, and we are going to discuss it now. The probability of a type 2 error depends on the standard error of the mean. We denote it sigma x bar, and it's calculated as sigma, which is the population standard deviation, over the square root of the sample size n. Larger sample size, which means increasing n, decrease the standard error sigma x bar. If we decrease the standard error sigma x bar, we are less likely to make a type 2 error. So I want you to remember to avoid making a type 2 error and to correctly reject the null when it's false, you should consider increasing the sample size. 